are back in our series called It Is Written. We got one more week to go. Uh, I, I think it's one of the most important series I've ever preached, to be honest with you. Of course, I feel that every week, um, but that's probably a good thing. But the Bible is so, 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 so important. This is under attack today. People are saying it's not the Word of God. I highly encourage you to go to cornerstonecheshire.com to get caught up in the series. We actually talked about how can you trust the Bible? Didn't man put it together? How do you know it's true? Uh, we deal with those topics. We deal with where the Word came from, okay? So I don't need to re-preach it, but please go there and look under it. And we, we're dealing with these different topics, and that's why we have series for it, to try to get a little a greater depth and a greater breadth of what we're trying to accomplish. So we're talking about that. Today we are continuing how to understand and interpret the Bible. And, and that this is not for the select few. This is not just for the learned. This is not just for the PhD folks. This is for everybody. The Bible is for everybody. It is extraordinarily simple to the point where it's almost insulting to your intelligence, some people would think. But the funny thing is, it may be simple, and you can drink from the Word of God and get something out of it, but the deeper you go in the well, it's unsearchable. That you can go deeper and deeper and deeper. Same meaning, but greater depth, greater impact. And that's the beauty of it. It's absolutely phenomenal what the Word of God will do. And we believe it's the Word of God. So let me go ahead and hit on the major theme of this series, and we're going to launch off from there today to talk about a little bit about how to interpret the Bible, and then we're going to talk about this, the secret to understanding the Bible. The secret to understand the Bible. There is one primary secret that I'm not going to tell you until the end of the sermon. It's like one of those newscasts you watch. They tell you, wait till they, and they keep, no, okay, I won't do that, but you'll see in a few moments. Okay, let's get right into it. What's the obvious secret to understand the Bible. It's obvious and it's not obvious. If it was so obvious, we would get it. But sometimes the things are the most obvious are the ones we struggle with the most. They say if the police are looking for you, the best place to hide is by the police station. <laughs> not that there's anyone in this room that would ever need to know that information. Okay, here we go. Colossians 1, 16 through 18. For by him, that's Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. All things were created through him and for him. And he, that's Jesus, is before all things. He always was, always will. He is the prime mover. What happened? Who's the beginning? Who's the end? It's almighty God. And Jesus is in the process all the way through it. Okay, and he is before all things. And in him, everybody, all things hold together. You pull Jesus out of anything, it begins to fall apart. You pull Jesus out of the molecular structure, it all falls apart. The Spirit of Christ holds the entire universe together. We've been talking about this week in, week out. Why? Because I really want to make sure that when this series is done, there's some fundamental things that you have in your mind and that you know that Jesus holds it all together. You pull Jesus out, it all falls apart. He is the constant. He is what holds the universe. Literally, he's what holds the universe together, and he holds you together. And the Bible says very, very clearly, everyone who hears these words, hears them and does them, right, and puts them into practice, puts them into practice. The words is like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. How many of you want to be wise and be smart and strong? And so, th listen, God loves us. He designed us. He knows what's going on. You don't know everything. I got news for you. If I insult you by saying that, get over yourself. You don't know everything, and neither do I. But God has all knowledge, right? And so everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like the wise man who built his house upon the rock. So how do we make decisions? We make decisions by the word of God. We believe this is infallible word of God theologically, that this is the word of God. It not just contains the word of God, it is the word of God. So anytime there's a question, I say, what does the Bible say? Not my thoughts, not my feelings. Nothing more, okay, we, we don't, okay, they're nothing more than feelings. I don't care. God doesn't care how you feel. He does, but he doesn't, okay? It's not about feelings. It's not about what culture says. It's what the word of God says. And, please understand, God is not some angry, cantankerous old man that can barely see and has a white cane. No, he is a loving father. We sang about he's a good, good father, and he wants the best for us. And he is passionate about his creation, and he's passionate about you. 
And this is why he cares so much. So everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. So how do we make decisions, everybody? Rather than sit there and talk about all these different social issues, let's just arm you with the truth. The word of God is our answer. But I don't understand the word of God. I don't know what to read. This is why we had our series. Go back and listen to it. We've been talking about it. Very, very important, okay, about the word of God. Now, how to understand the Bible. Last week we spoke about a couple of things and remind you, we'll continue on with last year's, last year's. Last week's message, the Holy Spirit is the great teacher. See, if you give your life to Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit becomes your personal tutor, which will open your eyes when you read the passage of Scripture. He will begin to speak to you and instruct you what it actually means. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Number two, context is absolutely, positively critical. Without proper context, you can make the Bible say anything you want it to say. Anything you want it to say without the proper context. Okay? Context is key. Context is king in regards to understanding. Now, I want to give you a little of an example. Um, my son is not here right now, so I can get away with it a little more. I'm going to give you a little example of how some people look at Scripture and the methodology they use to understand Scripture. Something that's blatantly obvious that people today in the quote-unquote church will begin to dissect and pull apart Scripture. Because I'm a PhD in biblical languages. I know Greek and Hebrew and Latin, and, and I know German. And not only that, but I'm just so smart, I, I can win Jeopardy. That's how smart I am. And so I know how to, not me, but somebody else, okay? Uh, but that's what they say. And so they, they can win. They understand the scriptures and they say, no, no, no. We've evolved of the culture that the Bible is a living document. It evolves through time. And, and so it, it, the beauty of the Bible is that based upon the set of circumstances, as culture evolves, so does the Bible. So what the Bible said, it kind of changes and it morphs into what's going on in culture. That's the beauty of the Bible. And by the way, we can't trust it completely. It's got good stuff in it. That's that's what people would say. But how would you interpret scripture? So there are people that will attack scripture today. Now, can I just give you a little example? All right, here we go. All right, this is, a, this is what's gonna happen. Don't ask me how I know how this would go about, but this is just all imaginary. I have nothing, this never happens in my life. <laughs> but if Sandra and I decide to go out for the evening and we write a letter which we tend to do, or text message. Now what we do is we write a letter and we tape it on the door so they can see it clearly. And we leave the lights on, okay, so they can see it. This is, a, this is a, an imaginary letter. This didn't happen in real life. Of course not. But if we did ever, this ever did happen, this is what happened. Here's a letter to one of our children. We're not going to mention which one. There's only two that have cell phones in our house. Two children, that is. Okay, here it is. It's a school night, by the way, and it's very important that the children get to school on time, and they have their cocktail break ready. They have enough sleep. Okay, I'm a good parent. All right? I just want to make sure you understand that. Oh, are we in an agreement, everybody? Okay, here we go. At 9 o'clock, this is a note, please get ready to go to bed. Before going to bed, brush your teeth and turn off the lights. By 9.30, be in bed with your phone off and charging where? In the kitchen. Thank you very much. You think that's... Okay. We love you. We'll be back at 11 o'clock. Okay. Now, what are we telling the child to do? We're, telling, we're giving them grace. We're giving them 30 minutes to brush their teeth, get their pajamas on, okay? Get in their room. Have the cell phone in. And that's clear. That, that's... That's this blatantly clear. There's no hidden agenda. It is what it is, right? You would think so, right? Now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do what our children sometimes do. And what some theologians, quote unquote, who, the, who take the Bible apart and say things it never says. So if you would please bear me a few moments as I show you what our children, not my children, but your children. <laughs> okay, here we go. We're going to analyze a, a sentence, okay? We're going to be scholars here. At 9 o'clock, please get ready to go to bed. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Okay, mom and dad say please. What does please mean? I'm so glad you asked. Let's look to Mr. Webster. 
Okay, this is what please means. To afford or give pleasure or satisfaction. So mom and dad want to afford, give pleasure or satisfaction. That's why they're saying please. Also, it also means to wish or do as you please. Therefore, what they're saying is do as you please, go to bed. Can you see that's what it means? So for you not to say that you're archaic and you're hateful, that's hate speech. Okay? So that's what we're saying. That's what please means. I hope you understand that, okay? Now, let's continue on with the, with the sentence, with the paragraph. Before going to get bed, brush your teeth and turn off the lights. Oh, wait, 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 wait. What does turn off mean? That's a real turn off. See, turn off means that you don't like something that is inappropriate. And there are phrases that you and I say, like the Patriots winning a game. That's a turn off to me. The New York Giants should be winning, okay? That's a turn off, all right? So, turn off to stop the flow or shut off hours by turning a control, turn off water, to cause or lose interest. Okay, so it's, they're losing interest in turning off the lights. And they can do what they want to do because we said please. Therefore, they don't have to turn off the lights. Okay, are you tracking with me everybody? See how, see how ignorant we are as a society? See how we have to read and properly interpret um, commands? At 9 o'clock, please go ready to go to bed. Before going to bed, brush your teeth, turn off the lights, and be in bed with your phone. Ah! Mom and dad said, be in bed with your phone. How much clearer can you get? And, and we're not done yet, because be means to equal in meaning, to have the same connotation, to symbolize, to have an identity with, to constitute the same idea as an object or an existence, so I can exist. And they said, be in bed. Okay, be in bed with your phone and, 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 and charging in the kitchen. We love you very much. Now, here, if there's any doubt at all about this note, we're going to eliminate all the doubt because love wins. Love wins. What do you mean by that? Well, I'm so glad you asked because off, okay, by the way, it says here off. And what does off turn off? Off means uh, a distance, space, or time. So this, okay, we'll just move on. Okay, finally. We love you. We'll be back at 11. Right here. This is enough. We don't even have to interpret the rest of the, of the, of the, of the, of the paragraph because this is king. We love you. Now, what does love mean? I'm so glad you asked because we being, you know, looking into the actual language, Mr. Webster again, we're quoting, this is how we interpret. Love is, oops, there should be a space there. Okay. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm kind of being what it says. But anyhow, okay, let's move forward. Um, I didn't say that. Okay, a strong affection for another arising out of kinship or personal ties. Uh, listen, this is the part. Unselfish, loyal, and benevolent. Okay, and you're unselfish, loyal, and benevolent. So why would I ask my children to do something? I'm unselfish, I'm benevolent, and I'm loyal to them. Therefore, what I've told them doesn't really matter. I hope that's clear. Now, how ridiculous is that? I wish I could say that that was an example of something insane and it doesn't happen. My friends, this happens. You go to certain universities or certain theologians and they will, they will take scripture and they'll just completely throw it apart by saying the Greek says. And pastors do that too. To make their point, to try to say uh, something in scripture, they'll take something, it may be true, but it's taken out of context, which is bad hermeneutics. Let me say something. I'm going to offend a few people right now. Uh, let me just say something very clearly. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you cannot drink wine. Okay, there's people that say that. It, I'm not making this up. I'm not making it. There's people that say this. That the wine in Jesus' day was like grape juice. And when Jesus made, yes, right, when Jesus made the wine at the wedding, it was grape juice. Now, if you go to an Italian wedding and they're pouring it all night long and you bring Welch's grape drink, you know what's going to happen to you? You're going to be in a river someplace with cement shoes. Hello? It's not grape juice. And for a theologian to say that wine is grape juice is, is horrible. If you can use that hermeneutics in that interpretation process, then you can make the Bible say there's an aliens living underneath the White House. Do, do you follow me, everybody? 
Now, the Bible does say if it causes a brother to sin, don't do it. And you have to think about that. And so that's why, as a church, we, we choose not to because of the fact in our... If we were in Italy, we'd be serving wine right now. We've had wine in the cafe. If we were in Germany, we'd probably have beer, okay? <laughs> the worship probably a little more free. But anyhow, let's move forward. All right, how to understand... Look, the Holy Spirit, the great teacher, and context is critical. Okay, can you, but can you see, this is what's happening, everybody. I'm, I'm, I mean, I wish I could say that was as insane as that is. That's what the, well, the Apostle Paul really didn't mean that because actually it was, it was actually about um, being gracious and hospitable. That's what he was talking about. That's the real sin here. And so, uh, and, and there's other people that say this, and I'm gonna just, uh, I'm gonna step some toes again. There's a preacher out there right now. I'm gonna mention his name. This is what he says. He's a very good uh, orator. He's an excellent, probably the best sermon I ever heard on grace was from this preacher. Phenomenal. I agree with everything he said. But he takes it to the other limit. This is what he says. He says that when you read the Bible, what, what Jesus teaches in the Sermon on the Mount is pre-cross. Therefore, we don't have to pay attention to that only after the cross. That's insane. I mean, I mean... The people out there saying that kind of thing. Uh, and they say, well, you know, so even people on the evangelical side of the equation, not just the uh, quote-unquote liberal church, which I, that word is thrown around, thrown around so much these days that it lost its meaning. But nevertheless, so context is critical. I just want to help you understand this is what people are doing. Okay, the Bible is flat out, it, it's pretty clear. It really is. And if you have to make the Bible do all these jumping hurdles, then you're probably taking it out of context. And the Bible will show you other places in Scripture where it is as well. Never take a passage by itself and use it only by itself. If you can't find it another, where in the, another place in the Bible, or at least the context of it, then it's probably not that important to make a big deal out of. All right? So, now, here's another question people ask me. Is it arbitrary? Can we just choose and pick and choose what we want? Well, uh, unfortunately, we all do it, including me. I do it subconsciously. I'll be reading through a passage, help the poor, yeah, whatever. I'll be right through it, not even see it. Not even see it. Because I don't want to see it. I'm giving you an example. We do care about the poor, but I'm saying that's an example that can happen. Okay? Is it arbitrary what still applies? Can I just pick and choose? It actually, absolutely is important. But what about the Old Testament where it talks about shrimp? I know I mentioned this last week, but I do want to bring this up because this is one of the major objections people say. Well, you can't have shrimp and shellfish. And you have, you have mixed clothes, so it's okay for me to marry my dog. Because love makes a family. Now, you're laughing. You're laughing. There's a story of a man over in Europe marrying himself. The person should be, don't take this the wrong way, should be in an institution. Uh, it's a medical problem. Okay, I'm, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to be judgmental. But the Bible says God gave him over to reprobate mind. This is what's going on. You wait. Some of you treat your dogs. Oh, never mind. Let's move forward. <laughs> okay, let, let's, let's bring the context. What do we choose and not choose? Remember, we mentioned a couple of things about the, the Old Testament. There were three types of law. Remember we mentioned the fact there is moral law, which is not changed. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, yada, yada, yada. Okay, that's absolutely true. However, there's ceremonial law, how to take the, how to make the tabernacle, how to put, how to do the sacrifice system and the whole nine yards, right? And then there's civil law based upon the nomadic tribes in the desert at that time. The, the civil law and the ceremonial law changed. The moral law does not. That's very clear. So people try to twist. It's just like that note I showed you that we sent, that someone sent to their kids. Okay, let's talk about the Old Testament and how it works, okay? There are people who are saying, we need to unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament, which is the, perhaps one of the most ridiculous things I've ever heard from an evangelical preacher. Because guess what the Bible of the early church was? The Old Testament. Thank you very much. All right, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors, Hebrews, through the prophets at many times in various ways. But in these last days, which has been since Christ has ascended into heaven, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, 
whom he appointed heir of all things. In other words, everything we were hoping for were types and shadows. Here came Christ, heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. You see that? Who made the universe? Jesus. Okay, thank you. Okay, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Jesus is God, not a God is God. All right? Sustaining all things. He sustains all things by his powerful what? Word. Okay? So, and not just Colossians, he holds the universe together. You can see it again here in Hebrews for a different writer probably. So we see agreement in the scriptures. After he had provided purification by dying on the cross, pay for our, our, our price, for sins, he sat down. Now, in a Jewish mindset, sitting down means you're done. So if dad sat down at home, you're in trouble. Okay, so I'm going to sit down. And Jesus sat down. He completed it. He closed the book. The first act is over. We're in intermission. The second act is coming in the second coming. We're in an intermission right now. And he's saying, get people in the theater. Get them into knowing me because I'm coming back with the second act. And the second act, we're going to close the door. Right now, it's come to everybody. The second act, the door's closed. It's too late. All right? So he sat down to the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So basically, this is the truth. The Old Testament law is fulfilled in Jesus. Fulfilled, not, not destroyed, not obsolete. Is that clear? Okay, so the Old Testament law is fulfilled in Jesus. It is not obsolete. And, and amazingly enough, everything you see in there is a type, a shadow. I don't have time today. It's absolutely astounding. Everything points to Jesus throughout the Bible. It, it, it's astounding. Absolutely astounding. Now, this is what Jesus has to say about the Old Testament. Okay, oh, but this, this is before the cross. Really. And anyone who says that, turn them off. Sorry. I, you know what? I'm, I'm stepping up a little bit more because I'm tired of all the nonsense. Uh, and I, I'm okay. I'm not going to mention people's names, but when they come against this, I got a problem with it because this is the word of God, and I will defend the name of Jesus. I don't care about preachers or churches and all that, but I do care about the word of God, and when something is as sadistic as that twists and snakes its way in, it's as ridiculous as that letter that the kids wrote to the parent. The parents, you know what I'm saying. Okay. If you don't know what I'm saying, go back later. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, I but to fulfill them. Okay? So Jesus has to say. And, for truly I say to you, until the heavens and earth pass away. Have the heavens and earth passed away yet? Okay. I know we have, never mind. Okay. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota or dot. What is that? The punctuation. It's not even going to change. We'll pass away from the law until some is accomplished. All is accomplished. So is the Bible going to change? No. Only what changes is what Christ fulfilled. All right? Now, there's some difficult topics. For example, people struggle. What's the deal with the Bible and slavery? The Apostle Paul says, slaves, obey your masters. Really? That's what the people said during the, the time of the Civil War. Before the Civil War, they'd say, slaves, obey your masters unto the Lord. And they used to beat them up and mistreat them. That's why you can't trust the Bible. Sorry. You can't trust the Bible, right? Because look at that. See? It's, it's, um, it's, hate. it's a hate book. Well, you need to understand that slavery in the time of Christ, in the time of the Old Testament, in the biblical and the in Hebrew society is a lot different than slavery in America was. So you can't superimpose the culture of that day, of the 1700s and 1800s, and put it back with the same standards of back then. All right? How would you like to be judged by math uh, when you're in third grade for calculus? Would that be fair? No. The people were eight, they didn't know better. All right? So some difficult topics. Why? Here we go. Why would the Apostle Paul endorse slavery? Well, let's look what, did he really endorse slavery? First, look at here. There's a difference between what the Bible records and teaches. Just because the Bible talks about slavery doesn't mean it endorses it. The Bible records something. It, it, it tells you the about, you think the Bible endorses um, um, adultery and murder? No. But King David committed adultery and murdered somebody. It tells the story because the story tells us message. 
okay? And plus the Bible talks about these things. So there's a difference between what the Bible records and what the Bible teaches. Just because it talks about it does not mean it endorses it. I hope that's clear, everybody, all right? So, 1 Timothy, for the sexually immoral, sexually immoral means doing things that are not morally correct, okay? For those practicing homosexuality, for slave traders, they had slave traders back in those days, and liars, some of you are liars, okay? And perjurers, right? What does it say? And for whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, hello? Sound doctrine, sound theology that conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God which he entrusted to me. Okay, the Apostle Paul. Now, what's some of the sound doctrine? It's not just the New Testament. Let's go to the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy, it talks about this. If someone's caught kidnapping a fellow Israelite and treating or selling him as a slave, the kidnapper must die. Okay, so that's, that, I mean, that was unheard of back in those days that you could do that. That was common. You could put whole soul of someone into slavery. You must purge the evil from among you. An owner who hits a male or female slave in the eye and destroys it must let the slave go free to compensate for the eye. Well, slaves are just property. No, in the biblical understanding, God gave more humanity to both men, women, and slaves. But why did God allow it in the first place? Why does God allow you to breathe and eat when you are doing things that are terrible? Let me just stop here for a second. You know, um, God takes us, God deals with us based upon what we know, okay? There's a lot of stuff we don't know yet. And we have, this, we have this crazy idea in the Bible that God showed up every day and talked to people as a man talks to a friend, though it did happen with Moses. But do you realize the book of Acts is over a span of 30 years? It's the highlights. If I were to give you the highlights of the last 40 years of my life, you would think I'm the most supernatural man. I mean, we had miracles upon miracles throughout the years. I could probably list 30 or 40 miracles that happened that were amazing, starting with my dad having a visitation of Jesus, okay? I could, you're like, wow, it's the book of Acts. But sometimes I don't know what God's saying. I have to ask God. I go through times where I'm wondering, right? And so they don't always understand everything either. They're, they're like us. Elijah was a man like us. There are times where, God, what are you saying? And they struggle like we struggle, everybody. And do you miss God sometimes? Have you missed God in the past? Do you know things now that you didn't know back then? Aren't you glad that you weren't judged based upon your ignorance? Okay, case in point. This is God's very, okay, his what? His kindness leads to dependence. Just because God lets you off the hook doesn't mean he's saying that's okay. Peter says God is not slow about his returning, but he cares. That's why he's delaying, all right? So we can see that. If a slave has taken refuge with you, do not hand them over to their master. That was like unheard of in those days. And back in those days, if you owed someone money, Sometimes you go to slavery until you paid it off. But in the Old Testament, in that society, they gave, more, they gave more humanity to slavery than any other culture surrounding them. They gave rights to it. And they said, when, when you uh, do your fields, do not cut the ends off because you were once slaves too. So there was a tremendous amount of service and tremendous amount of benevolence given to slavery. Does not mean God wanted it. It means he dealt with the ignorance of the people. Just like, by the way, he deals with our ignorance. Does that make sense? Okay? All right. Here's another one. By the way, this is coming to a, a state near, near you. Check your local listings. Polygamy is on its way. It is. It's on its way. Give it five to ten years, depending on what happens in the political realm. Your, polygamy is going to happen. What is Polygamy. It's insanity, okay? <laughs> Polygamy is multiple wives or multiple spouses, okay? Okay, what is it at the, same, at the same time? At the same time, okay? So why did God allow polygamy? After all, it, it, and back in the time, let's be honest here, it was all about the man. He could, man could have as many wives. Look at Solomon had, what, a thousand wives and 300 porcupines, right? What did, isn't that what he had? All right? So, what's the deal with that? Well, let's, let's look at, we see what the Bible has to say about polygamy, all right? That is why, this is Genesis 2, we'll go right at the beginning. That's why a man leaves his father and mother and united his wife. This is for the Italian moms here, okay? 
when your son gets married, mom, you need, to, you need to cut the umbilical cord. I knew somebody that said this, you can't marry my, my baby unless they stay in the state. That's breaking the scripture. Sorry. That's why a man leaves his father and mother and is united with his wife. Can I hear an amen, men? Amen. You guys are afraid. If this was an all-male audience, you'd be like, yeah! Okay. <laughs> and this goes for women, too. Okay. That's why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. And now, later on, the Pharisees come up to Jesus to try to trick him, okay? The Pharisees, by the way, were the legalistic, biblical church of the day. The Sadducees were Sadducee because they didn't believe in God. They were the liberal church of the day. The Pharisees were the conservative church of the day. They were focused on the family type of church, okay? I'm not against focus on the family. But they're really strict. And Okay. I stepped in it. Forgive me. And the Pharisees came up to him and tested Jesus by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? And by the way, do you realize that in the, in the laws that were that they were following in those days, the Jewish people, if your wife burned your dinner, you could divorce her. That's how bad it got. So, men, now you have something to stand on. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I totally disagree with that, by the way. It's terrible. If I burn a dinner, then they can leave me. Okay. Uh, so, it is lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause. And what did Jesus say? He answered, have, what did he say? What does public opinion say? What do they say on MSNBC? What do they say on MSBS News? What? What do they say on Fox News? What do public opinion say? Did he say that? No, what did he say? Have you not what? Say it. Read. Read. That who, what? Read what? The scriptures. Jesus quotes the Old Testament. If Jesus quotes the Old Testament, guess who needs to quote the Old Testament? And know the Old Testament. We do. Okay? He answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? Now, for me saying this, this is controversial now, for me saying this. Okay, listen, there are people out there that struggle with their sexual identity. They don't, they're struggling with it, and, and we give grace to them. There are broken people out there, okay? And we're not to be judgmental or angry, but we have to, the Bible says that's, that's the original what it's supposed to be. Are there, do we live in a broken world? Yes. Are there broken people? Yes. Am I struggling with that issue? No. Are there people that struggle with that issue? Yes. Is it legit, whether, they, is, whether you think it's a legitimate or not, they're struggling. We need to give grace to them. However, we don't change the rules for someone that has a disorder. Okay, I'm sorry to say, everybody, the Bible is my final authority. Not public opinion. But we don't need to get on our high horse and judgmental and point down to people and say, ah, it's because you don't struggle with that. You struggle with a lot of things. And if we, if we held you accountable to what you struggle with, with the same veracity we give those folks, you'd be a mess and be in big trouble. So be careful. Be careful. Humbly. Is that clear? Is that clear? Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Have you not read from the beginning, he made them male and female? And said, therefore, what does Jesus do? He quotes the Old Testament. He quotes Genesis. A man, a man, 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 not men, man. Okay? He said, therefore, a man. Okay? Man. Okay? shall leave his father and his mother, and he should hold fast to his wife. <laughs> Not wives. Wife. What did you learn in church today? Wife. <laughs> Men. Okay, is that clear? Not plural. Okay, should hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. All right, everybody? That, that, that solves the issue right there. But what about the polygamy? What about Abraham? Okay, let's look at that for a moment. Read the Old Testament. There's not one instance in the Bible where polygamy ever turned out good. It was a complete train wreck before trains were even invented. It was horrific. 
Look what happened to Keturah. Look what happened to Ia. Look at the problems it created. We're still fighting wars today because of what took place. Because he listened to. <clears throat> because he was not man enough to do what was right. Jacob and Esau. Look at that. Polygamy. I mean, look what happened with uh, Jacob. Look at all the problems it caused. The Bible, the Bible is not silent. If you can read the Bible and have an understanding, the Bible's saying, it doesn't work, don't do it. And Jesus even says, have you not read from the beginning? Right? Are you following me, everybody? No, we're not done. We're not, we've got more. Okay. Jesus goes on. So there are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has, what? Joined together, let no man separate. God hates divorce. Why? Because he wants you miserable. No, because he loves you and he knows how much it will hurt you, hurt your kids, and hurt society. You break up the family, you break society. What's the enemy's job? Break things and destroy things. And what's God's thing? To pull it together. Now, we're not done. There's more. They said unto him, okay, this is the religious crowd. Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate, ooh, certificate, of divorce and send her on her way? Why did he do that? You know what? You want to know the reason why? He said to them, because of what? The hardness of your heart. God deals with what he can deal with. If you're so hardened in your heart and you don't get it, you're blind, you're deceived, then God deals with you on the area that you understand. He gives grace to you. Just like you give grace to a child pooping in its diaper at two years old. But if they're 22 years old, it's a different story. Okay? All right. So he said to them, because of your hardness of your heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from what? The beginning, it was not so. It's not God's design for divorce. Now, I know that probably 50 or 60% of you have been divorced, and I understand that. But... This is what Jesus says. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. Oh, great. I'm going to lose the whole, con I'm going to lose half of you now. The congregation's over now. What am I supposed to do? I just insulted everyone here. What am I supposed to do about that? Well, let me just say something about that. A couple things. Divorce is not the un unpardonable sin. And we make mistakes. God gives grace in new days. But it does not mean we have a hall pass. Go ahead and do what we want to do. Okay? And Listen. I know it's tough. I know we all make mistakes. And God's a God of second chances. But it's not an escape clause. Oh, okay, I'll just do it and God will forgive me later. Okay, there are, there, we cannot digest this and dissect this and do it justice in this service. There are legitimate times for divorce. Okay? There are legitimate times to break it off. If your spouse is beating you up, get out of there. If your spouse is verbally, not just saying, do, um, clean your, put the laundry basket away. I'm talking viciously tearing you apart. Get out of there. We're not for abuse, ever for abuse. And nowhere does God permit abuse. Okay? But sexual, sexual morality and marries another and commits adultery. However, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians brings a little more um, understanding about this. He says the following. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. So if you're there to someone and, they're, and they leave, and they, you try the best you can, it's a different set of circumstances. But don't try, to make it, don't try to make it fit into that. Don't be a Cinderella story and try to get the glass sip, slipper on your divorce. You know what I'm saying. We do it all the time. Let's go make it, I'm going to make it fit. Don't make it fit. Is that, okay, I, I can't break it down all now, everybody. But God hates divorce. You know why? Because he loves us. It hurts you. It hurts society. And we're so flippant about it today. It's really sad, everybody. Wouldn't it be nice to know? I told my wife, I will never leave you. I don't care what you do. I will never divorce. I, will not. I made a commitment to her. I will not. I'll be single for the rest of my life. I would not divorce my That's my personal conviction. Why? Because my kids can come home at night and know that mommy and daddy are not going to leave each other. That's security. Do I have to do that? No, it's my own personal conviction. Okay, I'm, if I made you feel bad, I'm sorry. 
understand, God does it for our own good, not because he's against us. Okay, let's move forward. All right, so we have let the um, Holy Spirit context is critical. Let the Bible interpret the Bible. There's a couple of things I want to bring to your, your um, attention. And consider its context. Maybe the Bible's not meaning what you mean. If I offended you, please, I know what happens sometimes. I'll say something like divorce. And all of a sudden, uh, the, uh, the emotions dump into your stomach. And you shut off. You don't hear anything I'm saying. Go back and listen to what I'm saying. I'm not against you if you're divorced. It's not by the grace of God. My parents almost got a divorce. They were this close to doing it. But you know what stopped them? Thank God, my mother said. A woman came to my mother and said, what you're doing is wrong. And my mother said, I'm going to listen to the word of God over my thoughts and my feelings. Now they're married 60 years. 60 years. Praise God. They hate each other. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Mom and dad, I, they love each other. <laughs> All right. How do I read the different uh, uh, genres of the Bible? Uh, there's different things. Okay. The Bible Project, please go there. It's fantastic. Okay. All right. There's narrative of history. You read that differently than poetry. Okay, the poetry says, as a deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you. I'm not sitting there out there looking, where's the river? I'm panting for it. No, it is, it's a poem, everybody. So obviously you don't do it that way. You read it differently, okay? You see also, there's wisdom, there's poetry, there's wisdom literature. I'm going to let some of you off the hook right now, okay? I know the Bible says, train up a child in the way that it should go. When it's old, will it not depart. But I trained up my child, and my child is now uh, on the Taliban. What do I do now? My child walked away from God. I'm a terrible parent. Well, guess what? Uh, the, uh, the wisdom literature are basic premises of common wisdom, but they're not laws. Because if that was the case, then God would be illegitimate as a, as a God. Because what happened to Adam and Eve? Okay? So some of you are beating yourself up about that. Now, if God gives you a promise, claim to it. Claim it, pray it, but don't beat yourself up over it. Okay, so it's poetry. There's wisdom. There's prophecy, which is uh, another way to do prophecy. It's, it's a different way to interpret prophecy. We're going to have a course in February. You all need to take it. How to read the Bible. It's not a, not a scholarly uh, leaving the dust thing. It's it'll help you practically do it. That's one of the things we're doing here in our church. We want to teach you to read the Bible. All right, there's gospels, which are the four gospels. Then you have the epistles, which are probably easier because they're letters written to the church. And then you have the apocalyptic stuff, which talks about the end times, the book of Daniel, Ezekiel, Revelation. All right, now there's benefits in studying in community. You need, don't do this by yourself. Because what the apostle Paul did is the Bereans, now the Berean Jews were a more noble character than those in Thessaloniki. Why? Because the Apostle Paul was speaking, and while he was speaking, they searched the Scripture to make sure what he was saying. I pray you do the same with me. Please. Okay? So you need to study in community. There's power. That's why we want you to small groups, everybody, because you can hear a lot of things by yourself. We purposely need each other. Okay? Examine the Scripture every day. See what Paul said was true. This is what they did. They examine the scripture. You need to do the same with me and anyone else for that matter. All right? Um, so anyhow, great things happened as a result of working together. Now, what is the secret to understand the Bible? God longs for your heart in relationship. God longs for your heart in relationship. That's number one. God wants your heart more than he wants your behavior. God longs for your heart <laughs> more than Siri. Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Another version says it's where all your issues come from. It's the heart. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. Don't let bitterness come in your heart. Guard your heart. Why? And he said, this is what Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all of your soul, and with all your mind. Why? Because you're designed by God to love God. And let me say something about this, very important. If you surrender yourself to God, you're going to love God. Why? Because that's the way you're designed. Does a duck know how to swim in water? Okay, you're designed to be with God. 
And once God is right, you're going to fall in love with him. If you surrender, it's your design. It's going to happen. Okay? If you search with me with all your heart, you will find me, the Bible says. Okay? It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth. This is what defiles a person. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. All right? Now, for the Lord sees, not as a man sees, man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at what? The heart. Okay. Now, if you want to change your behavior, the best way to change your behavior ultimately is to get your heart to Jesus. Change your heart before you change your behavior. And the, even dietitians tell us, if you try to go on a crash diet where you're only eating rocks and bird food, it's not sustainable. You gotta change the way you live your life to have that, right? And so if you wanna change your behavior, change your heart. And so that's why God looks past, Jesus looks past your behavior. The church looks at your behavior because we can't see your heart. But God looks at your heart before he sees your behavior because your behavior doesn't really matter to him if he doesn't have your heart. So let's look at the heart. And we're trying to parent our kids from the heart. We're still in the process. Lord, help me. It's not easy. It's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, raising kids. All right, besides raising myself, that's the most difficult. Okay, now, does it matter? Yes, our behavior changes, but guess what? Our behavior also matters. The Bible says the deceitfulness of sin. So if I'm, if I'm holding unforgiveness, if I'm uh, lusting, if I'm um, doing all sorts of things and, and, and bitterness, and if I love that happens, that begins to inject my heart and it begins to harden my heart. So behavior matters as well, but first is the heart. Okay, we focus on this and forget this. And that's why people leave the church. They're like, I don't want any part of that. It's legalistic. We must focus on the heart because that's what God cares about. If you change this, you change this. But what you do here will infect this. Is that clear, everybody? Is that clear? Please, please, please. This is the difference between uh, grace and truth. This is the difference between legalism and being, being reasonably correct, right? So you have your heart. Always, it's always about the heart before the behavior. But the behavior will affect your heart. Therefore, watch what you're doing lest your heart gets infected, becomes hard, and you don't care anymore. Work on your heart. That's why Jesus says, come as you are. Come as you are. I'm going to ask the worship team to make their way up. Here's the big thing. Big, big, big. Perhaps one of the most important verses in the Bible when it comes to this. This is Jesus. If you love me, you obey my com what I command. He's not up to If you love me, you'll do the dishes. If you love me, you'll obey me. No, what he's saying is this. If you love me, you're going to want to obey me. Because love wants to serve. And so my objective in life is so simple. Rather than me trying to get everything right, oh, it's exhausting, everybody. You know, I've got to do this. I don't focus on getting everything right. You know what I focus on first? It helps me a lot. It helped me a lot. It's a big revelation for me, is I focus on loving God. And when I spend time in his word, spend time in his presence, you know what he does? Hey, um, hey Eric, um, that little area over there, that's hurting you and other people. You need to change it. And then I start changing my heart. And I tell other people, my friends, I'm struggling. Help me. Keep me accountable. I told my wife. And we work on the heart, and our behavior changes. Do you understand? I hope you understand that, everybody, okay? All right? For the Word of God is living and active. It's active. Sharp at any two-edged sword, piercing the division of soul and spirit joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of what? Man, guys, spend time in his word. Lay on the beach of his word and let his word tan your skin. That's what it's like. Being in his presence is like laying in the sun. I just, oh, just the radiance and the glory of God. And I pray you feel it today. Let God change you from the inside out. Fall more in love with Jesus. And the other stuff will work out. The other stuff matters, but not at the expense of the heart. Let me ask you to bow your head and close your eyes.